Hello, everyone. Checking out the D Platinum Mask podcast. I am Grayson Mask. I have with me Amani Black, who is a local DFW photographer and curator, and just uh, overall, just kind of multi talented creative who's done a bunch of different local DFW projects. And this was a conversation that kind of originally popped up, uh, you know, kind of knew her through my older brother and just kind of saw her a lot through just my local network and. Um, hanging out and collaborating with kind of either writers or other creatives I knew kind of in the Dallas area. So always just uh, and kind of recently actually met in person for the first time. So, you know, always wanted to be able to kind of put this together and, uh, you know, reached out and was be able to, uh, you know, jump online. So thank you again, Amani, for just, you know, taking out the time this evening and just being open to sharing your story about kind of what started some of these creative projects. Yeah, no, thank you. I really appreciate you letting me come on here to talk today. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess I'm first like just kind of curious on, you know, your upbringing into the, did you, are you like a Dallas-Fort Worth native or, you know, where where did you grow up? So I was born in the DFW area, but we moved when I was really young. So I was raised in North Carolina and then I moved back out here for college in 2013. And were you like always um, like in North Carolina, were you working on like creative projects at like an early age before like coming to UNT? Yeah, I was. So I've considered myself, I've always been a photographer. I've always had a digital camera, always loved taking pictures of things. So that's been like ever since I was a child. And um, then in high school, I would say I got more into making like music video type things where... um, I knew I wanted to be a music video director. So I would go on Tumblr and like use Windows Movie Maker to like put a bunch of GIFs, GIFs, whatever you say, (laughs) Um, together and like have it flow to the beat of the music and everything and just made my own music videos. So I was known for doing that. And I put a couple on YouTube recently. But yeah, it's like been a forever thing. And like starting, I guess like playing around with photography at a young age and kind of doing that in high school. So did you have like any, I guess, like family members or like were your friends in your local circle, like also into photography or were you kind of like, I I guess, alone in that kind of photography passion? Um, I was kind of alone in the photography passion when it comes to my friends. With my family, I mean, my grandpa, I didn't know this until later, but he said that he, when he was in college, he uh, he was he went to school for like RTVF radio TV film, and so I was very impressed because I was like, oh, you know, I have I'm super interested in photography and videography. So here's something that here's some um, something in my bloodline shows why I really like art. It was I'm kind of curious on like what um, you know like starting out on. Was there any like specific equipment you have or like if someone is starting out similar to you, is there any like equipment you would possibly recommend? Maybe if they're um, maybe if they're trying to get more bang for their buck or they have a limited budget. Um, yeah, I would honestly say start with an iPhone. You can do everything with an iPhone. Um, one of the reasons so in high or growing up up until about 2012 when I was like a senior in high school, um, like I always had a digital camera. So I would be ready on Black Friday (laughs) every year to like buy a new digital camera. And so once I finally saved up for like Christmas or something for the iPhone, my first iPhone, I still have it, by the way. (laughs) Um, When I signed up or not signed up, when I saved up and got that, like I felt like I stopped using my digital camera. And the only reason why I started using a digital camera again later was because um, I had a family member gift me a DSLR camera. Otherwise, I was doing a lot of this on my phone. And I was gaining traction through that, but not really just because I wasn't serious about it. Or, you know, it was just a thing. It was just a part of my personality. It wasn't something I was trying to monetize back then. So, you know, I was kind of known for it, like in college with my friends. But yeah. When you're kind of like saying on like not, I guess, blowing up originally off photography or not trying to monetize it, do you think it's more about like when it comes to, I guess, 
photography projects that blow up is it more about like the story behind them or is it more about like the quality of the images or like the actual i guess like portraits um definitely the storytelling aspect of it is really important that's why photojournalism is super important there's a lot of money in that industry and so but i think as far as like quality I'm sure if your photo isn't like the worst, worst quality, because like there's pixelation, but, you know, pixelation could be an interpretation of a different type of art. So while it's still photography, it's like artistic photography. And then I think every photographer knows that, like, if you post on Instagram or really most websites, the quality is going to downgrade regardless, because that's just how it is. So... I would say it's definitely the visual storytelling aspect of it. And then quality is important to me, but you can get away with it because everyone literally knows it's hard to have your picture quality stay as perfect as it was when you took it and edited it. And kind of like on photography, really with your website being on on kind of like one of the earliest projects you mentioned with the Black series, I was curious, like, on, you know, what led that, if it started, like, uh, in Denton, and, like, what led to the original idea of uh, even putting that together? Yeah, so um, for my 21st birthday, I got a camera. I got my camera, and I had always wanted a camera. Like I said, I was doing everything on my phone during college, and that was nice, but I knew I wanted to, like, monetize my hobby because I saw people like I paid someone I knew to take pictures of me for graduation and I was like I've been taking pictures forever like I (laughs) I should be getting I can get paid for this if I get a nicer camera versus like using something I bought in high school and just using my iPhone too so once I got the camera as a gift um I also got like a new phone that birthday too (laughs) so I was just upgrading at that point but I got the new fam- the new phone, the new iPhone and the new camera. And, you know, I knew I wanted to make money after graduating um, from college, like a couple months later. I knew I was going to want to make money from, adver- not advertising. I went to school for advertising. Yes, but I meant photography. <laughs> I knew I wanted to make money from my photography since I saw that you can make money from photography. And it's something that I'm good at and enjoy. So um, I just built a project the black series and decided that I was going to put it out every year as like an ode to like the people in my life, like my friends and my family and just places I like as well. And so I did that. I worked on it for like a month. Yeah. I found, I I remember recently it was, I only worked on it for a month. I started May 1st of last or of 2017. And, um, I just, I just wanted to take pictures of my friends and cool places that I liked in Denton. And so I did, I used that camera, that new camera. And then I also took like a couple pictures with my new iPhone at the time too. (laughs) And I put it in there and I, it was the black series. And that was my first like idea. And my, the idea was to repeat it every year because it would give me something to publish every year. That's like, if I didn't get booked for a photo shoot or something, like at least I'm still doing photography regardless if I'm getting paid or not. And so i I put it out every year ever since 2017 and 2019, I would say things started blowing up and then 2020 and 2021. And even this year, I don't know. Things have been blowing up since 2019. I can say that. <laughs> and like with that original founding of the black series. So I, I was kind of like going through some of the photos. So what led to like the, the premise of like, um, just only having like black attire uh, on like what kind of made that idea within the, I guess, black series. Yeah. So my last name is black and I wear a lot of black. (laughs) And I think that uh, like black is a flattering color on every skin tone to me. Like it looks good. So my friends, they all look different. Some of them are black, some of them are white, some of them are like everyone's different colors. Everyone looks different to me. And so, um, you know, it's a color that's universal, looks good, and it's just simple. It keeps it in line with the name too. So you wear black every black series. <laughs> I think I've always like said that with my like 
own a tire but like whenever i say like my favorite color is black like people kind of say like that's not a color that's just like without that's the end of the spectrum or without color do you do you say that as well? <laughs> uh no i don't i've never thought that. i've never thought of that mm-hmm. but like um when you kind of were saying like with this series blowing up since 2019 so was there any like uh I guess stopping like with 2020 or were you able to still, I guess, be able to find like ways to do photography with like COVID going on? Yeah. So 2019 was my first time being in a gallery. It was a super hectic time and it taught me a lot, which I thought I was going to end it then. I keep every year since then I've been saying I'm going to end it, but I never do. It's my project. But it was just a really hard project because I was doing a lot of things at once. But it really did teach me how to prioritize and move forward and balance my other interests as well as this being a constant thing every year. And um, with 2020, I delayed it. I hadn't delayed it. It came out around May or June since 2017, 2018, 2019. So 2020, you know, we were still kind of figuring out what was going on during the summer. And like I usually start during springtime, like April or May. And, you know, we didn't know what was happening. So about August, I was like, or mid-July, because I started, I planned shoots out like two weeks later. But like mid-July, I was like, nah, we can go out. People are in the club. No one's wearing that. I was like, it's lawless. I'm doing my project. It's just pushed back. So it was supposed to come out October 1st. It ended up coming, it ended up coming out on October 10th, um, which is a month before my birthday. <laughs> so... I was, I don't know. I had to do it. It's my thing and it's got to come out. And that like transition from uh, kind of like being in Denton and college and like starting this series to like getting into galleries and being in Dallas, is there like better opportunities when it comes to like the city environment, like Dallas, when it comes to photo shoots, photography, or is there like a better feel when it comes to I guess like the college environment or more, I guess like rural areas of Denton. Do you mean like for opportunities to be in galleries or? Um, I I was going to say like just uh, photography sessions in general. Oh, well, I would definitely say Dallas because I live here. (laughs) So there's one advantage, but um, no, I I would say they're both beautiful in their own way. Um, It's, when I was in Denton, I thought Denton was so great. Like I loved Denton. And so only because I moved is the reason why, well, I'm not going to say that's the only reason why I planned on moving regardless, but you know, just to keep doing it every year, regardless of where, where I am is, you know, part of the original mission I had in my head. It's like, I plan to move to New York one day. I plan to live in LA one day. I plan to live in Europe one day. And so it's like, I want to still do it because it definitely shows the kind of like a transition in my life. Like you're seeing it each year. And I feel like each each set or each Black series just keeps getting better and better. So imagine like when I'm 30 years into this versus at five right now, that's a long, that's a lot of progress. <laughs> and when you like brought up the idea of um, like this project being like still, you didn't imagine it going past like 2019. It was like still a presence um, like when you're kind of focusing on other things, like with your like work ethic, do you require, do you like there being like multiple projects at the same time? Or do you need to focus on one project specifically, like with 100% of your effort? Like, um, you know, which, like, what's your work style like? So previously it was balancing a lot of things at once. So the Black Series is a project every year. I'm always thinking about it year round. So that's something that's like a constant at this point. (laughs) So that's one thing. And then I had Day with Dallas. And so that was, it started off as a documentary. So I was thinking of who I want to, you know, follow for X amount of months. Um, Just thinking about like playing a lot of roles within that because it was my project. Like it was a documentary. I filmed, I planned the schedule, I had to think of all the questions I posted on social media. Like I did everything you could think about in a production by myself. So like, that's like a lot, that's like 10 things in one <laughs> on top of like 
during 2019 as well, I was like um, looking for a new job. So that's a stress, you know, looking for a new job while trying to still be good at your current job. <laughs> so that's like 15 things at one time, essentially. And I realized that sometimes I would have to take breaks. But when I did, it felt really bad. And now I'm really learning that I thrive best when I'm able to focus on one thing. Because even with one thing, there's still a lot in it. <laughs> so imagine having like 10 things or 10 different like things to do within one project times four. That's a lot. Versus like having 10 things within one project. Just that's it. Mm. When you mention like day with uh, Dallas on kind of that idea popping up, I mean, it's definitely um, when I was able to check out the page and go through some of the interviews and some of the postings that you had, I mean, it's definitely, you know, uh, like an idea that originally, I mean, kind of like the same premise that hit me when I wanted to kind of create the, the plan of mass series on be able to find like cool people I found in the local area and kind of be able to follow their stories so was that like, I guess the original premise on, what was it like 2018 when Day with Dallas originally came out? Yeah. Well, we started filming in 2018. Um, and then it came out at the beginning of 2019. And what like made it go from like that original documentary to just, you know, being an overall just standalone platform by itself where, you know, I was kind of saying where you do interviews, you do photography sessions, like you kind of have historical facts uh, in Dallas. Um, you know, I was curious on like what made it uh, branch out like that. Um, so season one, it was a lot because it was just me. Like I initially for the first episode with the bralettes, I had some help from my friend, um, but then he became a father. So, you know, his priorities change. So I ended up having to do the second, third, and fourth episode. They were originally supposed to be five episodes, but, you know, he kind of had to fall off uh, at a certain point. So it was like I was doing this alone. So, you know, putting on a full production by yourself is ridiculous. It's crazy. I can't believe I even did it. <laughs> it's mayhem. And it's a lot on top of, like I said, I had like other things going on um, as well. And just life in general. I always have something going on. So after season one, it was really hard and I had to power through to finish it because I was like, I have to finish this. I have to set a deadline and I have to get it done versus dragging it out even longer before it like releases and everything concludes and I'm done filming. <laughs> so I was like, you need to have a hard stop and do it. And I did it. And I had a party at Trinity Cider um, as well. And yeah, I just realized I had I was doing too much at once and having one thing at one time is just way better. And that's why I made things kind of scalable for myself by just using my iPhone to do the interviews, to do pictures, videos, everything. Cuz that's way that's fun for me and it's way more manageable to just do it on your phone and not even make it like super complicated like Short form video was my, that is my specialty, <laughs> but I'm also really good at long form as well. But like during that time, during COVID, COVID hit, that's what happened. I was planning on doing like a season two where I did film. I bought a GoPro and everything, but um, COVID hit during the time I was like planning my shoots. So I was, on, I was planning on doing a short film that year, not for Day with Dallas, but two separate productions. <laughs> And then I was going to do season two of Day with Dallas and then COVID hit. And I'm like, dang, I was about to be crazy and do the same thing that I didn't like doing by myself last year, again, this year. And COVID hit and I was like, wow, I have to pivot. I, I, like, uh, yeah. With, like with the middle of like season two. So was there ever, I, I guess looking back, was there any like anger on not having like a full team to uh, be able to do that? Or did you prefer like being able to, um, I, I guess, like have like the entire brainstorming by yourself and be able to, like you said, kind of with the iPhone on being flexible on doing short term videos? Uh, like, would you, I, I guess, looking back, if you could like prefer to have a team or did you like appreciate the um, like kind of solely taking on those projects? Um, I would say it's kind of half and half. I think working with my friend before he became a father was really good experience in understanding that 
I don't know, just like when you're the boss, when you have the idea, you really have to own it. And if you don't do something, it's not going to happen because this is your friend helping you versus like, you know, I would feed him. So it's like he wasn't doing it for free, but it's like we were both building our resume as well. That was the thing, like why we were both in it. So he definitely has credit where he is. But, um, you know, I just kind of realized like how to work with people and how to be the boss, like how to be the director to tell people, okay, sit, stand over here. Okay, no, we need to focus. Like, you know, doing a lot of like different things. So it was really good to have a partner. But then again, doing it alone, it was, there was like more freedom as well. Cause I didn't have to worry about like, you know, transportation for more than one person. Or like, if my friend is late, like, dang, now I'm looking crazy, <laughs> you know, or I don't know if I'm late and vice versa. Cause that's happened too. I was late and he had to go in there and film. <laughs> But, um, you know, I like both aspects of it, but with what I, be, I don't know, I just knew I had to pivot and I felt like it was unethical to be out there doing a documentary during the pandemic, which during the time when I was planning to do it before the pandemic hit versus doing it after like, you know, when everything shut down and all that. So doing the short form video was like super, that's what everyone was looking at. TikTok blew up during uh, you know, the co during the beginning of COVID and it was just 15 seconds back then. So, <laughs> you know, versus now it's three minutes, but you know, everyone was looking at short form content and I surely was like, I was on TikTok a lot. <laughs> so it was a good shift of everything and a breath of fresh air to keep me motivated to keep going and like protect myself as well as others. It's kind of like funny when you mention like the idea of TikTok um, and kind of blowing up like because of the um, socially distancing, the pandemic and just the wild time that it came up as well as a bunch of different apps and different platforms. I remember like, uh, was it during like 2020 where you were doing like your original like virtual art gallery or when did that pop off? Uh, the virtual art gallery was in 2021. So it was in December of last, wow, about a year ago. Yeah, December of last year. Um, I saw that in 2020 and I wrote it down. I remember, I literally have it in my notes up. I was like, wow, I wrote it down, whatever day it was. It was like May of 2020 when I first saw something like that. And then I finally put it out last year, like my own version of it. And do you see like, um, I guess like with that, like with the, I guess, future or huge um, like wave behind that when it comes to like versus traditional like in-person art galleries? Um, I see kind of where the benefit is. Like now you have NFTs and people are buying art and they're paying a lot for it and it's just digital. It's, it's weird. NFTs. And so that's transformed. That's really taken off like during, um, wait, that's crypto. Sorry, I'm thinking about two different things. They're kind of related, but not really. But a lot of things have taken off during the time because it was like virtual and everything. So, you know, while I do think that virtual art is really cool, I love that it's accessible. So like you can, someone in, in freaking China can see it like and look through it and experience my art like i love the thought the thought that all you need is an internet connection like a lot of the globe has internet connections so <laughs> you can see my art like it's about accessibility from that sense to me but i do think that in person there's nothing nothing beats an in-person experience like that's why not all malls are dead that's why a lot of stores are being built versus like them shutting down like they were for so long so i think there's definitely value in both but in person is way better. So like with, um, you know, you making your own art and kind of building and having these kind of lifelong connections with other local artists um, through your projects like Black Series and Day with Dallas. So where did the original idea for, I guess, like art curation, like come from and like being able to like host with one of these? What was like the first venue? Um. So... The idea kind of came in 2017. I went to Lit Hop. That was my first time going to like Deep Ellum during the day. And like, I went before, but I was like 20, so I couldn't drink. <laughs> and it was at night. So it was my first time in 2017, like being able to day drink and attend this like Lit Hop festival. 
So I went through that and it was like a bunch of like art and it, it seems so like I had just published a black series, like, or I think I was working on it during that time or I don't know, it was around the time it was about to come out or had already came out. And it was really cool. And I was like, my art is this good. Like I can put it in here <laughs> or put it like in deep album somewhere. And so, but I feel like I did want to get more confident and just keep getting better. But it was already, it was an aspiration at that point to get my photography in deep ellum. And one of the places I asked was Kettle Art Gallery. Um, and I actually, years later, last summer, ended up putting my art in there. <laughs> and was that like, uh, so with the idea of um, like going into Kettle Art Gallery, so was the original premise on like, so getting your own art in there, where did like the idea, I guess, of like um, representing other artists or, um, you know, be able to help them get into their art in some of these venues? I would say that kind of um, inspiration came after being in Kettle Art, as well as being like, I did three, I was in three or four art galleries, including my virtual one, four art galleries last year. And it was, it was a matter of asking. And yeah, it was literally a matter of asking. <laughs> I went up to these places and, you know, there's nothing to gatekeep. You just talk to these people. Like I, you, your original question was how did I even start getting myself into galleries? It was just from talking. Um, Kettle Art did come later. The first gallery I was in was at Trinity Cider. They had just opened in 2019 or they opened at the end of 2018, but I didn't start going there until the beginning of 2019. And I was just talking to them and I gave them my business card. And I told them I was a photographer because, you know, they were new in the neighborhood and I'm new trying to figure this neighborhood out too in um, Deep Ellum. And yeah, I got that opportunity. They hit me up like a couple of weeks later to put my artwork in there in the springtime or summer, spring, summertime. And it was just from going in there. It was from, you know, introducing myself, telling them I'm a photographer. I was also interested in working there. That was why we were talking to. I'm glad they didn't hire me. <laughs> but um, you know, we kept, it was just by talking and going to these places. And so 2019, they invited me to put my art in there. In 2020, I was supposed to curate their space, um, during COVID. And, you know, it was just because I, I started my production company <laughs> and it, it shut down, but I started my production company and I wanted to do an event to like, not only put, I didn't want to put up my art. My, my focus wasn't my art at that time because I hadn't put out the 2020 Black Series yet. I hadn't started working on it. I hadn't started working on it until like later. But we were supposed to have an event and it ended up getting canceled because of COVID. So, you know, that was my idea then to like bring something together for the community. It just didn't happen during that time. But then in 2020, when I had those four art galleries, I realized it's just about talking to people and making these connections. It's not rocket science on how to get into a gallery, you know, just talk and ask. That's what I did. Frequent these spots and it's just do that. And, you know, it brings business to the restaurant or, you know, business as well, as well as like artists getting their shot and not realizing that there's not like much of a barrier other than you introducing yourself and you know, sometimes you have to wait as well. Like they'll be like, oh no. And then years later or time, you know, time passes, you could be in there. It just, it takes time. So with kind of, uh, I was wondering if there's any like differences between, I guess like approaching or doing a curation when it comes to somewhere like Trini Cider, like a bar in Deep Elm versus, you know, one of the coffee shops you've worked with as far as, uh, I guess like the type of curation that they want or the type of artists that they want to deal with um, when it comes to like setting something up into the venue. Cause I can imagine like, uh, I mean uh, definitely sometimes like the art can be possibly different in a bar versus a coffee shop scene. Yeah. Um, for the projects I've worked on, they really just wanted my curation. It wasn't necessarily the art. It was really my choice from, so I chose who was going to be in the gallery or what kind of art we're looking for. Like I chose, like I knew the basic rule for both of those instances were just no, no um, like nudity or sexual stuff, which I'm, that's cool. That's perfect. <laughs> so, you know, that was the only rule and I'm, that's a part of what I believe in too. So it was like, you know, 
yeah, it was about what I wanted to do and me just leading. And that's how I approached it. I was like, hey, I will curate this um, and make it really cool. <laughs> and kind of with curation, um, when you kind of talked about like your restrictions or the type of things you're looking for when it comes with, to like what artists give you, do you like... I guess there to be like a similar theme amongst like the different art styles, or do you like them all to be like each totally different from each other? Do you know, do you like it similar at all? Um, I'm really like, people are so different. I think the only thing I had in mind with my ro- most recent curation at LTH was that there were a lot of painters that submitted stuff to me. And so it was just, you get 20 or not 20, let's just do simple math. You get uh, 50 applications, 40 of them are painters. (laughs) One does like something, what is it? Uh, Interactive art, your brother, Madison, shout out to him. (laughs) And then one other person or a couple of other people do like something else, but it's not good. You know, the choice isn't that hard. It's like, okay, this can be a different, this can definitely be a unique space. And the paintings were just each of them so different. So I think it's just, it's a matter of what you get because, you know, while I am a photographer, I do look for photography as well, but I don't know. It's just, it depends on what, what's really I'm being, getting the most of as well as like when the artists submit to like, if they're introducing themselves, like, hi, my name is Imani Black. I'm a photographer and, you know, just, doing that as well when they have to send pictures of their work, it kind of shows that they're, 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 they have manners. I don't know. It's like you talk to people, you know, or you just give a little bit of an introduction. So it's like, that's how you catch people's attention. That's what I've learned. I've, I've worked in advertising. You got to do a little extra. It's just a little extra, but it'll get you so far. On like that process, uh, when you're kind of bringing up like my brother, as far as being like the interactive artist versus like the 50 painters. So is like the interactive <laughs> art, yeah, is like the interactive art, like the, like most rare when it comes to like the artists that you're dealing with, or are there other ones that, um, you know, are not like as common when it comes to like the applications you get? Um, so I would say interactive is definitely the rarest, um, it, or the most uncommon (laughs) one, but Madison's idea was just so unique and so perfect. It's like you put time and thought behind this and it goes so perfectly with what we're wanting. That's so incredible. Like I really respect that and really like that because you really, you thought about it. You put some, you put a lot of time or you put some strategy and intentionality about this. So that's really cool. I really, that's why that was like, oh yeah, for sure. He can definitely be in the gallery as far as like all the submissions. Like he was definitely one of the top people. And when it comes to like timelines on like the venue you're dealing with, um, when it comes to like setting up this curation, do they tell you straight up, like as far as like we'll promise that it'll be the curation will be here for the th- like a few months or do they say like we'll have it up for a month and see where it goes from there depending on you know the reactions or anything um no it's been we talk about this from the jump so i brought the idea to trinity cider and lth and i had a plan but i you know i learned it from my first gallery at trinity cider because they were like, we keep you up for like two and a half months. And I was like, oh, I really like that. That's cool. So like, to me, that's like a great time because during that time, guess what I did? I brought friends. I had a party. I had an opening party. Um, Then after that, every weekend I was there bringing friends, bringing my family, you know, it just keeps business going because my art's there. Go look at it. One, buy it also two, And then three, you know, buy alcohol. So it's like a win-win. Cause you're definitely getting like my influence, like my arts there. And that's why like, I also like, I love my friends were the focus of it initially, but then it kind of switched to more of the landscapes of scenic outdoorsy pictures. And the focus was like with people, which was a great idea from the jump, because when you have pictures of people, they'll post about it. They'll bring their people to the gallery. So it's not just me and the eight people that were in my, you know, black series. It's eight people plus, you know, 10 of their friends and family. So it's like, it's a, it's a connection that just keeps going and it, 
can only be good for the business because it's guaranteed like business. <laughs> And kind of building off of that, um, like with some of those curations, is there kind of like moving forward, is there any like curations like to be expected or is there any upcoming projects that, you know, that you haven't accomplished yet that you're definitely excited about? Um, I would say there's no curation set. I wanted to do just one art gallery this year with my work um, after I did the LTH gallery with everyone else's works works work <laughs> um with everyone else's work I just wanted to do one so that's like I have my one unless something really irresistible pops up but I'm putting my work at kettle art so it's not cura- curating at all it's just well I guess it kind of is we're going to figure out where it's going to be placed so it can get sold but you know other than that like no no more curating this year um as far as upcoming projects though the 2022 Black series will be coming out um, later this year. So it'll probably be in December. It'll be in December again. So yeah, that's just the main thing that I, oh, I'm also on YouTube. So like I'll be talking about the Black series and other arts and stuff. So those are just my main two projects, but they kind of overlap in a sense because I'll be working on both and they're related. It's kind of like, uh, I remember checking out that YouTube channel and like some of your kind of recent videos um where you kind of also like where you're kind of mentioning like behind the scenes but you also do kind of a lot of tips related to entrepreneurship and the creative experiences and one of them i saw was uh you did one about kind of llc's um that i was curious if you wanted to kind of break it down because i know like uh that was always something i was wondering about like on people I always hear, I thought I was always hear stuff about LLCs, like even if you're not making any profit of a business, like if it's good for taxes or something like that. So I was kind of wondering on, you know, your perspective of having one. Um, I would say don't rush to make one. Like I, I wanted to have one and I got one and it was just, I didn't, I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> So like, I think you have to be, I was kind of, I was intentional about it. I just didn't know what I was doing. And I ended up shutting it down like the end of last year. So I think it really depends on your maturity level and how much like you want to put behind it. Because the point of a business is to make money, to sell things and unless you're a nonprofit, but you still got to keep the lights on. So it's like, you're selling something, you're making money. That's the point of a business. And with an LLC, like, yeah, I've heard the tax benefits and, you know, just to have it, it, that doesn't make sense to me anymore. (laughs) You know, I wanted it just because I wanted to have a business by the time I was 25. And so I did it. I did it when I was 24, but it was like, I shut it down by the time I was 26 because I really wasn't ready. (laughs) Mm -hmm. It was like shutting it down. Was that like a, was like starting or shutting down like a more difficult process? Shutting it down was definitely difficult. Um, Starting it was easy. You just, if you pay someone to do it, but um, shutting it down, it was a lot of reading comprehension. So that's like, if you miss one thing, you could potentially be screwed. And I was like, I just want to get this done and correct and one shot because you have to mail it in. And it's like, I don't want any issues when you have to mail stuff in because it just, it just takes forever. And I was on like a timeline. Like I wanted it done like before I wanted it done before um, I had some services renew because I was like, I'm about to shut this down. I'm like, no, no, no. Let me make sure it's FedEx super quick, everything. So I think it it's easier to terminate it. I mean, excuse me, it's easier to make one. It's harder to terminate it, shut it down. And it's even more annoying to reinstate it if you want to. So it's just easy to start a new one. <laughs> Well, to like wrap everything up, I honestly just want to, you kind of mentioned like some of the upcoming projects you currently have and um, like with curation and with photography, was there anything else that, you know, you're excited about or want to mention for, you know, the rest of this year or kind of moving on into next year? Yeah. So um, really my YouTube is what I'm most excited about. I started doing like YouTube videos, YouTube videos in 2017 when I was in college because like I said it always been my goal to do photography as well as do YouTube 
And I got that camera for my birthday, like a couple months before. And I was like, ah, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm about to act a fool. <laughs> so <laughs> I was like, um, I put out a couple of YouTube videos. I put out a, quite a few that summer um, after graduating from college. And it was really fun. I really enjoyed it. And I, I stopped because I got my first like big girl job. And I didn't think that they would like me having a YouTube. But then while I was there, I learned that they like people who are accomplished. So it was always okay for me to have a YouTube and to do whatever else as well, like hobby, have hobbies. Um, but I kind of didn't do it. Um, I didn't do any YouTube videos really that often after that. Like I put out like, I did check. I actually put out one in 2017, 2018. So like I had a whole bunch of 2017, then one in 2018, a couple in 2019, because that was when Day with Dallas came out. And then one in 2020 or like it, I put out something every year, <laughs> which was kind of funny. But now I'm like, okay, this is, I did put out something last year. So this is in true fashion. <laughs> But I want to like keep it going because there's clearly an interest and it's something that I'm good at and have fun with. So I'm trying to make sure it's stuff that I really want to talk about. And there's I have I know what I want to talk about. Like I love talking about stuff like this, like talking about the process and being a creative and just sharing some of my you know good and bad experiences with that because it's life. It's bound to happen. Um, and if you can learn from someone else's words before. You can just understand how to approach the situation if it does ever happen to you. With uh, the YouTube videos, I was I was curious on if there's any like YouTube trends you would want to like start uh, jumping on or like be able to make videos about. I know like your I remember saying like the very first video you had on the YouTube was like was it like a uh, Frappuccino review? Yes. <laughs> Yes, it was a Frappuccino review. Um, that was my first video. I don't know. I just wanted to do it because I was so excited to try it. I was like, oh my God, it's so pretty. <laughs> and so I knew I wanted to put out a YouTube video. So I got it that day, made that video that night, put it out the next day. And it was just so funny. But um, as far as trends, I don't know. Um, every now and then, like stuff is just fun. So, like, I have a friend. We're doing a bean boozled. Um, have you heard of that game? Oh, it's like <laughs> they're jelly beans, and two of them are the same color. There's a bunch of different colors, but like two of them are the same, and one is disgusting. So, like, white would be nasty rotten eggs, and then another white would be vanilla. <laughs> So I'm doing like that game, but that's like an old trend. But like, I'm doing that game. Like I remember when we were in college and we did that game, it was so funny. We just didn't YouTube it back then. <laughs> so I'm doing it with one of my friends this week. So it's like, you know, certain trends, but it's just, it's fun. But my main focus is definitely going to be like being a creative and just sharing like the fun that I have while being a creative as well, because I'm making a bean boozled video. <laughs> I'm going to eat nasty jelly beans. <laughs> And overall, that's just what life is about. On, <laughs> but yeah, I know. Yeah. yeah, I remember what game you're talking about when you're describing <laughs> it. But yeah, yeah, I know. But no, that sounds like a. Uh, I mean, definitely a wild video like that. And I don't know. It definitely sounds like kind of building a series off maybe like other foods or something. Yeah, I definitely know. I'm very expressive when it comes to like my food. <laughs> So like my facial reaction, it's like authentic. That's why like people like that, those type of videos that I, when I was doing them in college, but you know, it's a mix. We'll figure out what sticks. Like I like to try things, but I also like to say, I don't like to jump on trends. <laughs> so like, you know, I don't know. We'll see what happens. I'm just definitely here to have fun and I love doing YouTube. So it's definitely good to like have something to think about and enjoy. For sure. Well, honestly, Amani, I just wanted to be able to thank you again. I think like, uh, I mean, not just being able to kind of describe your journey, but with like the photography and curation and with advertising, but just kind of like some of the lessons you learned for like from some of these projects and be able to share kind of the advice and tips for anyone like possibly wanting to follow in your footsteps, who's maybe a local creative and you know, wanting to do something related to photography or kind of art curating or 
um, just anything in the creative field in general. So, you know, thank you again for being able to describe all of it. And I think it's going to be really good information for, uh, you know, anyone interested. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. And you're so welcome. I'm so glad I got to come on and talk to you today.